Come, Nerevar. Today I want to tell you about the Ifrit and Tinus, which are... Wait a second. They're in color now? Huh. Okay, that's new. I mean, I have Deuteranopia, so this does not do much for me, but I hope at least you can appreciate it. Anyway, these creatures are both members of the Phylum Onicognatha. These are the Arizoans which in morphology come closest to Earth's vertebrates, as they are bilaterally symmetric and possess an endoskeleton and spine of apatitic makeup, though they also use a bit of biosilicon. But this is usually as far as similarities go, as many of the body forms these animals assume have more of a resemblance to arthropods, and in their very bony heads, there is little room for a brain. Phylogenetic bracketing indicates that the ancestor of this clade likely was a worm-like animal with a bony tail and ten or even more limbs, each attached to their own segment and with hands with two fingers. From this basic body plan, all further morphologies were achieved through thagmosis, the fusion of segments. In almost all living onicognaths, the eye segment fused together with the two preoral segments to form a solid cephalon, with the preoral legs becoming sensory antennae. Also, in almost all living forms, the first postoral limb pair fused with the back of the skull to form mandible like jaws, with the two fingers on each hand becoming arachnid like chelicaries. In the majority of forms, the remaining six legs are used for walking in a rather insect-like manner. A good example of this is the diminutive tinus on the right, just 20 centimeters long, which can be best described as a cockroach lizard. It is therefore also sometimes called the Mars roach. I once suggested the alternative cockars, but was sadly overruled. During the day, it is mostly found underground to escape the desert heat. During the night, it comes out to hunt smaller relatives and dust slugs. With its first pair of antennae, it mostly smells. With its second pair, it mostly hears. The breathing system of Anikognaths is decoupled from the head. Instead, there are six breathing orifices, one in front of each leg, which lead to their own lung sac, somewhat similar to the book lungs of arachnids. In most Onicognaths, like the Tinus, the four sacs at the front specialize in oxygenic respiration, while the hindmost pair has a more elaborate structure to create better anoxic conditions for methanogenic respiration, hence the elongated section behind the hind legs. Once morning arrives, the tinus usually laps up dew from smooth surfaces or even licks it off its own eye with its tongue. The eyes of all onichognaths are solid lenses made of biosilicon. This has both advantages and disadvantages in the harsh Martian environment. On the one hand, with solid eyes, there is no need to shield them from dust and sand blowing with the wind, as there is no liquid surface which could clot up the particles. On the other hand, the recurrent abrasion by sandy winds does over time create scratches on the eyes, which can impair the vision of the animal if they start accumulating. Many onychognaths therefore have to shed their eyes and regrow them once they wear out. Usually the eyes fall out asymmetrically, so the animal does not go completely blind during the regrowth phases. Generally, two grades are distinguished within the phylum. The paraphyletic archaeocephalia, which possess the ancestral chelicerous jaw apparatus and of which the tinus is a part, and the monophyletic cuneocephaly, which likely derived from the former. In cuneocephaly, such as the ifrit, the arm bones holding the chelicaries have fused firmly to the cephalon, and the bottom fingers have become an immobile lower jaw, also firmly fused to the rest of the skull. The sole movable part are instead the upper fingers, which have fused into a singular beak which opens and closes sort of like a toilet seat. Why these bizarre wedge heads evolved is hard to say though the rigid design has in some species allowed for the attachment of surprisingly strong adductor muscles for the upper jaw. Cuneocephali usually also have a more complex circulatory system than their forebearers. The individual lung sacs are interconnected, with the job of exhaling and inhaling being split up between the orifices and the oxygenic sections providing the methanogenic ones with carbon dioxide. The ifrit is a predator of smaller desert creatures like the tinus. It usually kills them with well-placed paralyzing bites to sections of the spine. Its actual method of eating is rather baroque, sometimes thrashing the carcass around or even performing death rolls in order to rip out pieces of flesh. What is fascinating about the ifrit is that it seems to be in an apparent phase of evolutionary transition. 
Cuneocephali descend from hexapods not unlike the tinus. In the ifrit, however, the last pair of legs looks like it is in the process of vanishing, as they have shrunk and are dragged through the sand rather uselessly. But they are not completely vestigial yet. Like all Martian animals, the ifrit is hermaphroditic, and once the time to mate comes, the two partners engage in rather daft wrestling fights to determine which loser gets to be impregnated. The small legs are used in these fights to help keep the opponent's hindquarters down on the ground. I hope you enjoyed this video and look forward to the coming ones. Make sure to like and subscribe, visit the project's original website, and maybe also check out my Patreon, Unua. There you may get to view the next videos early. Amazing thing about snakes is that they reproduce spontaneously. What do you mean? They have both male and female sex organs. That's why somebody you don't trust, you call a snake. How can you trust a guy who can literally go fuck themselves?